I, first of all, I must thank the TEDsters and the organizers, Emeka, Chris, for a wonderful, wonderful conference. I, have, I, I can't remember the last time I have enjoyed myself so much, almost sinfully so. <clears throat> and also, I can't remember the last time I have been inspired so much. I can't remember the last time I have uh, learned so much. And uh, also, so, uh, uh, a lot of thank you to all the speakers who, uh, who have done such a great job. All these uh, vignettes that have come in, this last one was just really amazing. I was uh, born uh, in Africa to African parents in the mid-50s amongst the flurries of, uh, uh, during the flurries of uh, the decolonization that would occur and mark the 60s of Africa. I was six when icons like uh, Mualimu Julius Nerere, uh, like Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, Tafewa Balewa, uh, uh, Kenneth Kaunda would come to Addis Ababa uh, to inaugurate a new age for Africa. Uh, this, this cradle for man, this cradle for many, uh, some, some of, the, uh, of man's greatest and grandest civilizations. There was such palpable hope. I was six, I didn't know what was going on, but I knew something great was happening in Africa. As Tabo Mbeki would say, it was a good day to be an African. Over subsequent decades, I saw that hope that was so palpable when I was growing up, and particularly in those early days, battered. Battered by, by genocide, battered by wars, battered by the kinds of things our brother just spoke about, battered by, uh, by pandemics, by epidemics, battered by all the kinds of things that have been discussed here, and yet a hope that was so resilient, a hope that, that was so powerful that left a kernel of optimism and that has, that has uh, been an engine in the passion and in the mission that has been my life's work, which is really to empower people with information. I have really been very disinterested in technology per se. I have been most interested in any vehicle that would inform people, that would deliver information, actionable information that can help people change their lives. That hope has instructed my energies. It has helped organize a, a small team of people, of very dedicated people, to actually conceive, build, launch, and implement a, a global satellite network that is today poised to cover something in the order of about 5 billion people driving 300 million cars in 131 countries. I have been passionate about empowering people with information. This passion and vision has inspired, uh, 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 or this vision was inspired by a series of articles that had began to come out sometime around the late 80s. I was working as a, uh, uh, as a lawyer. I was part of the 1% that the 99% have given a bad name to. Uh, I, I, and, uh, but there are a series of articles that were coming out on, on things like HIV AIDS and uh, uh, one of these articles was predicting that about 5 million people would die from HIV AIDS in Africa as a result of the lack of a communications infrastructure to be able to deliver information to people. So, uh, and then in fact by the end of the decade, true to the article, 17 million people would die from HIV AIDS. That's like the size of a sizable country. 17 million people actually died from HIV AIDS in the last decade of the 20th century. It was at once an aha moment for me. It was also a moment, a sad moment, uh, in that, I, I, I mean, since the mid-70s or so, I grew up and we all grew up in uh, slogans about the power of information that has been the mantra of our times, but I cannot tell you that there was no time, and even now I cannot comprehend how information can play such a role, how so many millions of people could die from the want of information, from the want of information most, most sadly, most like infuriatingly, from the want of information 
that is so easily accessible. That you don't need, it's not proprietary information. It's very easy to get this information. And even worse, information, once you get it and give it to someone, it's so easy to understand. You don't need a college degree to understand that kind of information. So for the want of available information, for the want of easily understandable information, 17 million people died. For, for I, I don't know how many other statistics, I, I can't give you rattle off statistics about how many other deaths have occurred in, uh, for, for similar lack of information in other areas. I'm just talking about HIV AIDS. This was 1990 when these predictions were being made. I had a secure job, I had a comfortable income, but I was increasingly uncomfortable with the callousness of our times, the callousness uh, of our species that Jane Goodall did such a fantastic job in explaining. I felt, you know, uh, I just couldn't understand how people could die, environments could degrade from lack of infrastructure that, to communicate readily available information. What I couldn't even understand furthermore was how organizations like the World Bank, the IMF, the, all these moneyed organizations, the African Development Bank, why don't they all get together and put such an infrastructure. It doesn't have to be a complicated infrastructure. It doesn't have to be broadband. It doesn't have to be cables and telephony. Why don't they just put up at least a simple satellite? A simple satellite that can talk, maybe not to a television, but to a radio, so that the radio could be ubiquitous, the radio could be you know, uh, uh, inexpensive to, to, to manufacture. Make it digital, so that maybe the, the, the signal itself could be could be flexible enough to allow, when moments and, uh, uh, require it, multimedia applications. But really, you can build such a system. And you know, I looked around, and this is literally between the beginning of 1990 and mid-1990, and I thought, like, you know, why don't I, if no one is going to do something, why don't I just start doing something towards building and launching such a satellite infrastructure? You know, I talked to my wife about it. I said I wanted to quit my job to do this. And she thought I was joking for quite some time. And then when she, she saw I was serious, she said, why don't you go ahead and do this? And then once you finish your exercise, go back and get yourself a real job. So, uh, and you know, I admit there were challenges. Uh, when, at the time that we were conceiving this, uh, there were, you, know, you need over 100 or so countries to actually allocate special frequencies to create a new service of this kind with satellites that, that talked to many countries. Uh, uh, no one had built a geostationary satellite at the time that was able to talk to a radio. No one had, uh, uh, and, and of course, you know, these, the, uh, so I needed technologies, uh, and I, obviously being a lawyer, uh, and still being a lawyer, I had to get this from some kind of engineers or some kind of companies. So it was really a daunting task when, when you thought about the whole thing. But more importantly, you all, I also needed a little bit of cash. I mean, like hundreds of millions of dollars, and I was short hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> so, so to make a long story short, we founded the company in mid-1990. We got our first license to build, launch, and operate a satellite over Africa in 11 months from founding the company. We got 131 countries to allocate frequencies for the service in 18 months from founding the company. We, within three years of founding the company, we got all these big companies to actually come together and sort of design an end-to-end -end system that would allow a satellite to talk to a radio in a sort of ubiquitous environment. And then finally, sometime around 1995, almost 1996, we raised $1.1 billion. By year eight, we had actually launched a satellite over Africa, and this would be the first satellite that was ever launched and still uh, ever launched, dedicated to actually, you know, there's Intelsat and all these other satellites that sort of make Africa a part of a much larger uh, uh, coverage area. But this is a satellite that was dedicated to serve Africa, a satellite, a system that was created to serve Africa. And what's more is, here's the, the, something that I am uh, happy about is that this was, as Chris mentioned, the first time that actually a new technology was debuted in Africa it was before it was handed down to the United States and other parts of the world. <clears throat> so I, I just described a very uh, uh, long period. By the tenth year, we, uh, by the eighth year, we launched our satellite. By the tenth year, we launched a second satellite. And between these two satellites, we cover, as I mentioned, five billion people. 
you know, uh, audacity invites its own adversity. Many of you who have started startups know the kinds of uh, issues that come up with, uh, with uh, starting a new, uh, a new enterprise of this sort. We had our share of it, but uh, uh, most importantly, that is not our story today. Our story today really is the fact that the passion that made this story possible for me was the horror which the lack of information would unleash in Africa. This horror is sitting in this room today. This horror is walking unchecked across this beautiful continent today. And that, I think, is the story. What have we done, you might ask, what has World Space done in these last few years with this, uh, with, uh, this enterprise? World Space itself had to be structured as a commercial enterprise uh, to pay uh, its investors for the money that they've put in, but we dedicated ample capacity to an NGO called First Voice International to carry the vision that made this journey possible. So, uh, the First Voice was created to provide actionable information to impoverished, to inaccessible populations. It works mostly with indigenous organizations to deliver critical information to, uh, to uh, using audio and multimedia services. The audio basically from the satellite directly to a radio set, and then the multimedia service, you connect that radio set to a computer, and then it becomes like a modem that can download data in, in pretty, uh, pretty respectable speeds. First Voice itself uh, today delivers a number of programs. I'll mention a few. We have soap operas in indigenous languages on reproductive health, on child trafficking, and a number of these kinds of issues. These in indigenous soap operas are being rebroadcast by more than 150 community radio stations, reaching millions of people today. We have many H uh, programs on HIV AIDS, on many aspects of the disease, from prevention to, to the various things that can be done once people, uh, once people are, uh, are, are known to have the disease. We have agricultural best practices that are being broadcast to 18 francophone countries in a multimedia format. We, have, we deliver uh, literally lectures uh, uh, in, sli in slides, PowerPoints, etc., to field agents uh, from the UN, the, the government, NGO staff in these countries. We have weather, climate, and early warning system that we have created for rural areas and farmers in 19 West and Eastern African countries. We have a food security program in the Afar uh, region where uh, uh, Zeres and I uh, the other day told us he found our uh, three million year old ancestor. We, uh, we have, uh, uh, and there it's a multimedia uh, also uh, program linking 48 communities uh, with uh, information and I'll speak a little bit about that a, a little later, but that we also have programs on good governance, uh, yeah, uh, teaching rural leaders and officials. The neatest thing about this is almost 90, 95 or so percent of the information we are getting actually, we're not going to Western capitals, we're getting it right out of Africa. They're locked. This information is locked in citadels such as uh, 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 of learning uh, universities or in, in government uh, headquarters. Uh, not, not for any nefarious reason, but no one still has a way of taking this information and spreading the ideas that these information carry. The, uh, so these are some of the ways by which uh, uh, literally a handful of people at First Voice International with a wide network of mostly indigenous partners are actually reaching millions of people to change their lives in actionable ways. There is, I'll tell you a couple stories. Abdi Sheikh uh, Harun uh, manages one of First Voices Community Information Center, he gives pastoralists true market value uh, information for their animals. It's a crude version of what Eleni Gavramatin uh, uh, talked about in, with her uh, commodity exchange. He says to us that, uh, you know, to quote, farmers don't sell their animals at throwaway prices. They are earning up to 30% more income today. Uh, th uh, then, you know, there is this, uh, these refugees in the Dadaab, refugee camp. It's one of the largest refugee camps in Africa. It's uh, in Kenya, in north of Kenya, 140,000 refugees. There are some young teenagers that were born there, that grew up there, you know, completely isolated, disenfranchised. They know nothing. They have no hope, essentially. And we have, uh, with UNHCR, we have put 
uh, receivers uh, 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 in, in this camp and, uh, uh, and, we're, and we're delivering information on uh, youth leadership and reproductive health. So the young people have began to come around and more recently they, they, they have formed a club and they call it the dot .com youth club. Uh, and uh, one day something absolutely incredible happened. Uh, the, the people that were organizing the programs, I think journalists call this Vox Pop, uh, uh, the people that were organizing these programs came to the camp and interviewed the youth that were listening, these dot .com youth club, about their views on health issues, etc., on sex, on, on leadership. And then the next day, these young people would hear themselves over a radio that was being broadcast from Cape Town to Cairo. And it was, you know, the, the way it was described to me was like a goose, goose bump raising moment. They never dreamed of talking to an entire continent. They never thought that their views mattered. They learned and they taught. They were empowered and they were empowering. One female refugee that was actually banned from this youth club by her father, a strict Muslim who didn't want her to be sitting down talking about sex with young people, with young men. And so what does she do? She goes off and insists on borrowing the satellite radio, and then she starts her own fem uh, female uh, uh, dot-com youth club. Uh, and uh, she, call, she says, you know, gleefully, that information is power. Of course she is right, information is power. When asked what we could do for him, Ernest Madhu, in his most moving presentation yesterday, said, help us by building capacity, by providing know-how, by providing education. In 2005, 45 million children did not see a classroom. UNESCO says 15 million children, 15, I, I'm sorry, 15 million teachers in sub-Saharan Africa require remedial training to qualify for global standards. So imagine, 45 million are out of school, and out of those that are in school, they are being taught by 15 million teachers, among others, I'm sure, that require remedial training to, to, bring, the, to, to bring their teaching standards to, glo to global standards. So yesterday we saw a great blog about uh, the children in Africa, about how they are the future of this continent, and the state of education that is necessary to make those, those uh, children uh, uh, powerful is in a grim uh, situation. Can we do something about it? Yes, we're all in violent agreement. Given a modicum amount of information, Africans can do, uh, 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 can and do solve their own problems. Ted has been a testament to this fact. Yeah, uh, look at uh, William uh, from Malawi, who built a windmill to meet, to meet his family's need. All he needed was a book to, uh, to show him how. These anecdotal stories are powerful, they are insightful, but here's what fires my imagination. How do we scale this impact so that we can have life-changing books and information that can reach the Williamses that are a potential across this beautiful continent? I think that, that, is the, that is the answer, that is the question we need to answer, and it can be done. We can put units like the one used in Afar in one million schools and neighborhoods. We can deliver language-specific libraries today. We can put remedial education for teachers we, uh, and stories galore from the likes of Vuzi and Chris Abani. In, in Afar, these units impact, each one of these units impact about 100 people a day per week. I'm sorry, 100 people per unit per week, providing area-specific, meaningful information. If we scaled up to a million terminals, you can imagine how, how many people we can reach, how many people we can convert to Jane Goodall's Roots to Shoots uh, kind of a program. How many Africans can we thus empower to help themselves? How much of that African ingenuity that mesmerized us at TED will we unleash upon the continent? It gets sweeter. How much of, these, uh, of the Africans that we heard can actually be used to, uh, to, uh, to make, to, uh, to make such, a, such an enterprise happen. So this is, to me, the idea that is worth spreading is creating an infrastructure that would help us spread all of the ideas that are worth spreading. Noah Samora, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.